Hi, everybody. All right, Billy gave me this, this question. Uh, what happens to us when we die? I think that was the question he asked. I, I think it was something a little bit different um, that he initially said. But anyway, I'm prepared for the same thing. All right? So what happens to us when we die? A lot of people think that this is the main question of the Christian religion. This is what Christianity is about, this topic. It's not. This isn't the main topic. This is not the main issue. It's related to the main issue. Uh, maybe later on we'll say what the main issue is, at least what I think, and um, I hope you think as well. Let's see. We'll compare notes. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we think that this is the main issue. But what happens to us when we die is not the main question of uh, the Christian faith. It, it, it's not. But it's extremely important. I mean, we care about it. You guys are here. Uh, you could do some other uh, interesting and fun things uh, with your evening. But you care, and I certainly care. It's a great honor for me to be here and to, and to talk about this. So I, I hope it's um, encouraging. And um, like Billy said, feel free to jot down your questions. I would love to do it more of a uh, classroom style because that's, you know, that's what I do on a daily basis where you can just ask as soon as it comes to your mind. But given a little bit of a bigger audience that we have that can get a little bit... Um, can get a little bit difficult. So just jot it down and we'll come to it. So let's start with this. Let's start with this. In order to even begin to address this question, before we ask what happens to us when we die, let's ask this more fundamental question. What are we, right? What are we? So that's the first question. Uh, you should know because you're, you're one of us. You're a human. But the big question is what is a human, right? What is a human? And <clears throat> Actually, this question is more difficult and more controversial than we often admit. We are humans. We should know what it is to be a human, but there's disagreement as to fundamentally what a human is. There's a biblical answer to what a human is. Now, this is how I'm going to approach this. I, I decided to approach it this way. I haven't really done something like this before, at least in this uh, exact kind of way. So I'm hoping it works, but this is what I'm thinking. I've got a few questions that we're going to raise, and... Um, a number of biblical verses that correspond to the questions. There are so many verses. There are so many areas of Scripture. I know Pastor Billy's uh, taking us through this year of biblical literacy, and you are learning the contours of Scripture and really digging into it. There is so much. If I were to just list out verses, uh, there'd be almost no end to it. I had to just pick. I had, in, so, in some cases, I was so torn. I was like, I got to go with one. I'm, I'm disciplining myself, we're going to go with one. So <clears throat> for these questions, what I want to do is have, let me pick three readers. Would there be three people who would be willing to come forward and just to give a different voice uh, every few minutes to read some of these verses, if you, if you don't mind? And so I'll just have reader one, two, and three, and I'll just call you up, reader one, two, and three. Can somebody put their hand up and be reader one? Okay, we got reader one there, and then reader two. I saw another hand here. Can we get reader two? We had reader one in the back. Are you reader? Okay, are you reader one? Okay, reader two over there. Reader two. Oh, okay. We're, okay, we had three hands. Do we have another hand? Okay, we got one, two, three. Okay, let's do that. So we've got reader one, two, and three. Is that good? Okay, good. All right. So here's the first question. You don't have to be so quick. You guys can sit down. I'll still intro a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at this. <laughs> I haven't practiced this. So, sorry, I don't mean to make you sit down and rush up. I just wanted to get hands for a second. Okay, so the first question is, what is a human? What are we, biblically speaking? I didn't bring my glasses, so I got to look down here. First and foremost, we are embodied souls. We are embodied souls. So actually, I will take reader one right now. Let's go ahead and read it. So reader one, Genesis. Uh, I didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> 2 verse 7. So we got a microphone here for reader 1. Genesis 2 verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So in Ge thank you very much. Thank you. So in Genesis 2, we're seeing the creation narrative, right? Genesis is the first book of the Bible, as you surely know. 
the creation of humanity. In the moment of creation, it's vitally important. These aren't just uh, sort of unnecessary details. God very famously takes the dust of the ground and breathes life into the dust of the ground. And we see this over and over through the course of Scripture, that we are addressed as embodied souls. God goes on to create the rest of all of creation, all of the animals and things, and they are called the nephishim, the living souls. We're not just merely bodies, right? So surely we are bodies. I mean, we're physical and tangible, and you're seeing me, and I'm touching my own hand and feeling it and that sort of thing. So certainly we're physical objects, but we're more than that. We're more than just physical objects because you have an internal mental life. You have an internal emotional life. You're not just synapses, and you're, you're not just all the physical parts, but you're something, in fact, fundamentally deeper. Uh, philosophers have noted that there's some weird things about humans that are not easy to explain just in terms of our physical parts, let alone just our brains. There are some, I, I think, overly optimistic scientists, narrow-minded, I might say, that think that all of human mentality can be explained in terms of what's going on in your brain. And m- many scientists of the brain and philosophers of mind, it's, it's, a, it's a discipline in philosophy, uh, are pretty sure that that's a fruitless task. Humans are much more than what's going on in the brain. There's a correspondence between what's going on in your mind and what's going on in your brain, but there's not an easy one-to-one relationship. And I don't even need to convince you of that. You're a human that has consciousness, thoughts, emotions, desires, all these sort of internal mental conscious experiences. I don't need to tell you that you're not just physical. One really weird thing about us as both spiritual and physical beings is that over the course of your lifetime, let's say, let's say you live eight, nine decades, you're going to replace every piece of your body down to the the most minute level. Over the course of your lifetime, the body that you're born in actually totally dissipates and is replaced with other parts. The body that you eventually die in is an entirely different physical body. But yet you have the same conscious experience through all of those decades, right? Isn't that a weird thing? Isn't that a weird thought? You must be more than your body. You can't just be your body. And so-called physicalists or materialists, people who think that we're just bodies and that when we die, the body goes in the ground and the person, the person himself or herself just rots away and then ceases to exist. This sort of attitude is just not so easy. A lot of these physicalists, materialists, they're very nervous about this question of mentality. Well, we see this in Genesis, that we were both physical and spiritual brought together. And the man exists, the human man exists, namely Adam, exists when the two come together. So that's very important. This is a hugely biblical idea. We're not ghosts in machines, right? So the body's not just a machine and we're not ghosts, you know, uh, sort of controlling a machine like a car and driver. That's not the biblical idea. We're not zombies. That is just bodies without souls, right? We're both. We're both simultaneously integrated. We are more soul than body, as we'll see. We're more soul than body, but we are embodied souls. It's actually inaccurate to say that you have a soul or to ask, does so-and-so have a soul? You know, some, sometimes people talk this way about some really vicious person. Does he even have a soul? Um, if we didn't have souls, then our bodies would just be cadavers, right? A body without a soul is a dead corpse. So the fact that I'm speaking and ex- expressing consciousness and a body is moving and alive and animated is evidence enough that we have an ensouled body. But as we'll see, we can live apart from our bodies. That's not the natural state, but in any case, the first living man comes into existence when body and soul uh, come together. And so it's not accurate to say that you have a soul. What's more accurate to say uh, is that you are a soul. You are, in fact, a soul. And in fact, the Bible speaks in this way. Okay, our second reader, reader number two. All right, who was that? Was We're in, we're in sold, oh, sorry, embodied souls, embodied souls, but there's more to say about it. So Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Was that it? 
Was that the whole passage? Just oh, okay, awesome. Just 27. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Okay. That's all we need. Thank you so much. All right, so we're in uh, embodied souls made in the image of God. Now, this is vitally important for the biblical narrative. Other animals are embodied souls. I mean, this might be strange. This might be strange to think. Uh, but biblically speaking, dogs have souls, right? And so if you're a dog person, you're like, yes, I knew it. Finally, somebody said it, right? <laughs> Finally, somebody who, who has some air of expertise said so. That's not, and you're a cat person. You're shaking your head. I see a cat person there. Absolutely not. Dogs are soulless, vicious creatures. Okay. It's not supposed to be this fuzzy, heartfelt statement. Like, we love dogs. Dogs have souls. I'm a dog person. I like dogs well enough. But that's not the point. Uh, the point is, if dogs were not imbo embodied souls, dogs wouldn't go. They'd be dead and inert like rocks, right? So if you have a pet dog and a pet rock, they have very different qualities. Like if, you, if you throw a stick, there goes your pet dog. If you throw a stick, you know, your pet rock doesn't do anything. And you're being silly if you have a pet rock, right? It's, it's supposed to be ironic. But you're not being silly if you have a pet dog. That's, that's not silly. That makes perfect sense. And many of us do it, right? Makes perfect sense. Souls are what makes things go. Souls are what give life. And that's, that's a biblical idea. Uh, certainly a, a high order creature like a dog has a, a, a consciousness and emotions and, uh, um, my dog does. And sometimes they feel shame and happiness and you, and you see all of this, right? And so you might say, oh, well, if dogs have souls and humans have souls, um, then we want to extend it and we want to ask questions like spiders. You know, as we get down to that level, seems like spiders are little biological robots. You know, it's hard to believe that there's anything inside. Um, so the question gets murky, and the Bible doesn't sort out all of that. But I do think that it does make good philosophical sense. I, I really do. But there's a qualitative difference between the human soul and the dog soul. Very important qualitative difference. Not just a quantitative difference, right? Quantitative would mean... Two humans can have quantitative differences, meaning you have just a little bit more of something than somebody else. So um, one human might be smarter than another person. They both have intelligence, but one has just a little bit more, something like that. Uh, one person might be faster, you know, in terms of like foot speed than somebody else. That's just a quantitative difference. They can both run. So they have all the human qualities, but it just, it's a matter of degrees. The difference between you and a dog isn't just quantitative like you have more intelligence, you have a totally different quality of intelligence than a dog. So one thing that you can do is you can think about your thoughts. Dogs can think. I know that my dog, he's not even very smart for a dog, let me just tell you. Uh, he's a dog, I've met smarter dogs, but he can think, I know he can think. But he certainly can't think about his thoughts. Those are called second order thoughts. And in order to think about your, uh, it, uh, in, in order to think deep thoughts, to philosophize and to even ask these sorts of questions and have this sort of conversation, you have to be able to think about your thoughts, which dogs can't do. So there's a fundamental difference there. That fundamental difference, biblically speaking, is identified in this idea that we're made in God's image. So we humans, we're animals, dogs are animals, but we're fundamentally different kinds of animals, right? That's why the sort of thoroughgoing Darwinian view of what a human is, that we just sort of emerged out of pre-existing animals, doesn't so well fit with the biblical picture. It doesn't really have to do with timelines or uh, you know, theories of the earth or something, because the Bible doesn't provide so much of that. It has to do with this question, whether we are only quantitatively greater than other animals or whether we're qualitatively different. And I think it turns out that we are qualitatively different. We're made in God's image. This is where we get the very important notion, the vital notion of human rights. I mean, human rights is a very important idea. I don't know how to make sense of the idea that you are intrinsically valuable, that you just can't be used and abused because I want to. Suppose I were some tyrant or dictator like Saddam Hussein and I could get away with it and it wasn't illegal and I could do whatever I want. Still, it would be wrong for me to use and abuse other humans. Why? Because whether I like it or not, no matter how much political power I have, you have intrinsic value because you're made in God's image. Just engage your moral intuitions here. You would probably agree with me. It's perfectly okay to kill and eat a chicken for food. 
That's a, an appropriate use of a chicken in some cases. And that's not to say that we should be inhumane or abusive to animals in any way, but it's a perfectly legitimate use. Of course, there are vegans who disagree, but look, I, I just don't think that that's right. I think it's a perfectly legitimate use. It's not a legitimate use for humans, even if we're very, very hungry. It's not a legitimate re- use to round up, to cultivate, to farm, and kill and eat humans. Of course, we call that cannibalism, and we think it's gross. But no matter that it's gross or anything like that, it's fundamentally wrong. Why? Because humans have intrinsic value. Chickens don't. Chickens don't. And so we actually do talk about human rights. We don't really talk about chicken rights. You, you know? And that's not just a joke. There's a reason. There's a reason. And it's not just because we're selfish or self-centered and we care more about humans because we are. No, it's because humans are, in fact, qualitatively different. So the human soul has high-order rationality qualitatively different than the animals. High order emotional, emotional abilities that animals don't have. But most importantly, the Bible will tell us that we have spirit. Our soul has this faculty called spirit, and it is the faculty of the soul that makes worship and communion with God possible. Dogs cannot convert to Christ, cannot receive the gospel, cannot become members of this church, right? Wouldn't that be cute? You know, your dog becomes an honorary member of the church, but not really, not really. Animals cannot be directly in communion and fellowship with God because they're not designed for that purpose. They're vicariously in communion with God through humanity, but we were directly created for personal communion with God such that we actually identify as children of God, right? Animals can't identify as children of God. In my own home, I've got children and I've got a pet, a dog, right? And the children eat at the table. They have that right. They're my children. And I love my dog too, but he doesn't eat at the table. He doesn't have that prerogative. He eats under the table. And if the roles were reversed and my kids ended up under the table and my dog ended up at the table, I'd say this, something went wrong, right? This is not how it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? So I hope that makes sense. This is the biblical view uh, of, of what the human person is, and it's vitally important. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. What is a human? Important question. Why do we die? Would be the next question. So reader number three, I think we've done one and two. Can we cycle through to reader number three? Would you mind coming forward? And let's look at why do we die, Genesis 3, 17. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, I have eaten and have eaten of the tree of which I command you. You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat all of it. Eat of it in all the days of your life. Thrones and the souls it shall bring for bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Yeah. By the sweat of your by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you have you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you you shall return. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So Genesis 3. Biblically, why do we die? Uh, We were made for fellowship with God. Uh, The reason why we die is, of course, this very famous notion of sin, rebellion against God, disobeying God, flouting God's Greatness and goodness, as if we have the authority to do so. We see this recorded uh, in this sin in the Garden of Eden between the primordial man and the primordial woman, Adam and Eve. God's direct creations, the first humans, our ancestors. Um, Sin enters in, and sin is this corruptive force 
that breaks fellowship between humanity and God. Our eternal life is contingent on our fellowship with God. We don't just have uh, e- eternal life in and of ourselves, right? Uh, we're born like fresh batteries, and over the course of a lifetime, that battery is drained, right? And uh, we experience that over the course of a lifetime, and you don't, you don't feel like you did uh, you know, years before, and, and you, you feel that draining happening. We don't experience a sort of natural, um, uh, unending sort of energy in us. We feel that draining. Well, the eternal energy of life is, is, is rooted in God. And so being disconnected from God, the breaking of our fellowship with God is naturally uh, what leads to death. And so it was um, uh, both, you might say, a metaphysical breaking in which uh, a real relationship between God and us was broken, but also a, a spiritual breaking, a moral breaking. And that breaking goes, all those cracks go all the way down to the depths of our soul, such that now we find ourselves in this situation that we're born and we die. Although that's not the way it was intended to be originally. So there's something fundamentally wrong. So again, the Bible puts its finger on the sense that even if you're not a biblical person, even if you don't accept the Christian faith, something we intuitively know, there's something just not right. And everybody asks this question. What's the point of life? Why do we die? What's wrong with humanity? How do we address the sickness that we encounter? The Christian answer is is sin. And it is illustrated here in the Garden of Eden. But it puts its finger on this. The problem is actually in us. I think that most philosophies and most, um, most sort of other views try to find the answer to human um, uh, suffering and the, and the sort of human question outside of us. Try to find it in something else. That's why politics is so important to so many people. Because if we can just correct the system, everybody will be happy and we'll have justice and there will be no pain or suffering. And that's never worked. That's never worked. It really has never worked. Not only can we not get the right political system, right? But even if we were to get a really great political system, we'd still find that it's just not working. It's just not working. The reason being is we're the problem. Or at least the problem deeply pervades each and every one of us. So it's not as if you can just round up all the good people and quarantine them from all the bad people and have this perfect, blissful, joyous, utopian society. It's never going to happen because all the people are bad. Okay, so that's the, that's the biblical view is that all the people are bad. If we think that the biblical view is that some people are good and some people are bad and good people are going to heaven and bad people are going to hell, you don't understand Christianity at all. That's not true. Here's the really bad news before the good news. Everybody's bad. All have fallen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are no good people. Everybody's selfish. We know it. If you don't admit that to yourself, you're not being very honest. All you need is opportunity. All you need is opportunity to be selfish in the most egregious, hurtful ways. All you need is opportunity. I know that about my own soul. I thank God that I've missed opportunities to be really harmful because I know that outside of God's grace, I, I, I have hurt people but I know it could have been so much worse. But because God cares and he loves and he has determined to love me and redeem me and protect the people around me from what I would do to them, I just haven't had certain opportunities and I'm thankful for that. But I know what I am. I know what I am. And the Bible asks us to look very honestly at our own souls and admit what we are. And the idea, again, the idea of sin is that the corruption is in us. And that's offensive. That's, I mean, if you're not a, a Christian, you're like, I, I don't like that idea at all. I find that very offensive. You know, people say, I think people are fundamentally good. And if you just put them in the right situation, and again, it's all sort of external. If there isn't injustice and, and they're all, everybody's given a fair chance, you know, people are, and, and basically people are nice. You walk into an elevator and you, you know, under certain conditions, you talk to a person, but pe- Basically, people are nice. But niceness is insipid. It's easy to be nice. Niceness is, is fake. But when it really comes down to a crisis of resources, if we had to fight over bread, we'd see everybody's, you know, real, the real person, right? You'd see the real person. And we might not like what we see. And sometimes we surprise ourselves. And, you know, the Christian answer is, uh, you know, I understand it's offensive, but people are not basically good. People are not basically good, not by a long shot. And so that's the, very, that's the very bad news. Just for the sake of time, if it's okay, I'm going to move us on. And um, 
Why do we die? It's because of sin. Now let's turn the, to the question of, of we who are in Christ. We who are in Christ, we say that Jesus Christ has taken our sins on himself. This is the idea. Um, even if you don't know the Christian faith all that well, you've probably heard something like that. Jesus died for my sins on the cross. That's what we say. Jesus has taken my sins on himself. Okay, it was my doing. He had no sin, and he took it on himself. And on the cross, what happens, according to the Christian faith, is an exchange. My sin for his righteousness. It's as if I'm in crushing financial debt. I have incurred a debt. What kind of debt? A moral debt to God. Um, how bad is it? You know, I'm in debt. How bad is it? And I look at my account, and it says negative infinity. <laughs> That's how bad it is. Plausibly, if you sin against an infinite being, you incur an infinite debt. And so the, the breaking that happens between humanity and God incurs in, in us an infinite debt. We can't build a tower to heaven. We can't earn our way into God's perfect and righteous and holy presence. We being stained and corrupted as we are, we don't have any right to be there. He's like the sun burning with holiness and we're little wax people. And if we were to walk into heaven under our own power, we'd be vaporized before we got through the threshold. That's the biblical idea. It's not as if, oh, I'm a person of goodwill and I love you, Jesus, and you love me. Let's be friends. It doesn't work that way. That's not the biblical view. God is not so small, right? God is much bigger, much greater, much more powerful. This is the biblical idea of God's holiness, right? So God is perfectly holy, perfectly just, and we're corrupt. We're nothing like that. And so we can't just have uh, fellowship with him just because uh, it seems like a nice little idea. And that's, that's the fundamental problem. So in order to solve that problem, God so loved the world, this very famous passage, he sent his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him uh, would have eternal life. And so in that mission, God sends his son, Jesus Christ, and on the cross, he takes our infinite debt upon himself. Now, given that he's fully God and fully man, he's able to take on the infinite debt and pay off the infinite debt because he has the infinite reaches of God's holiness within him. And now we go from being in infinite debt to being dead broke. Your account just went from negative infinity, really, really bad, to zero. That's really good news, isn't it? Would you rather be dead broke than be in infinite debt? Yeah, okay. So we're dead broke and we're like, that's fantastic. I couldn't be more happy to be dead broke, but uh, you're still dead broke. And you're really, really bad with these things. So we're under, under our own powers, under, by our own lights, we are going to sin again. We're going to continue sinning and flouting the goodness of an infinite God. We cannot do good works in and of, our, of ourselves. Our works are always biased. They're always self-motivated. We do good things for selfish reasons. But to truly do good things that are honoring to God, we have to have God's power. We have to have his righteousness with which to do it. So we say, we who are in Christ, we say that Jesus Christ took our sin on himself and in exchange gave us his righteousness. So we do good works. We do genuinely good things that are pleasing to God, but not by our own righteousness, but by borrowed righteousness from him. We participate in it because he has this infinite wealth. So he loves us. He pays off our infinite death and lets us share in his infinite wealth. And in that, on the cross, we're bound to him. And so that's the idea of the, the, the fundamental idea of the Christian faith. So let me just read uh, in Romans 8.1, a consequence of that, Romans 8.1 through 4. This is a consequence of that exchange that happens for us who are in Christ on the cross. Now that we are in Christ, this is true for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You've done some, some bad things in your life that you regret. You've done some things in your life that you've bitterly wept over that you wish hadn't happened. Maybe you don't even want to think about them right now. It's still painful to you. This is an important message I want you to understand. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation. I'm actually thinking about some things right now, and I'm going to try not to cry in front of everybody because that's a little embarrassing. But if you think about those things right now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life 
has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So that's what I was explaining before that God takes our sin on himself. And because that's happened, there is no condemnation. So when Christians die, it's not because they're being condemned or punished for sin. That's That's not why we die. There's no condemnation. It's a consequence of the fact that all of creation is broken and fellowship was broken in the garden and that corruption was passed on to us through Adam and Eve. And so... It's a sort of continuation and a finalization of that very sad story. But we die without condemnation. You're not under condemnation when you die. Uh, <clears throat> if it's okay, uh, well, I'll invite my readers back in a moment, but just for the sake of time, I want to read also Philippians uh, verses 3, 8 through 11. Philippians 3, 8 through 11. Why then do we die? Why doesn't God immediately, if this is the story and if this is really true, we would all easily believe it because every time somebody becomes a Christian, why don't they just become immortal in that moment? And then we would all see it and we'd say, hey, he never ages. What, what, what is that? What, what's going on there? Oh, I've been saved by Jesus. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so interesting. How old are you? I'm 700, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that, and that would be great proof. Well, that's not how God does it. God doesn't do that. We still die. But why do we die? Philippians chapter 3, 8 through 11. <clears throat> Paul says this. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. So I'm not earning my own righteousness. Remember, he's dead broke but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and might share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I might attain the resurrection from the dead. So a lot of times people don't hear this um, or maybe they don't fully grasp it. The fact that the prosperity gospel exists, unfortunately, maybe you know something about the prosperity gospel, name it and claim it and... um, uh, and this sort of, it's, um, it's a sort of avarice. It's a sort of a greedy theology uh, in which we're told that God um, it only dispenses uh, gifts and the mark of the true Christian life is all of this blessing. And you see these, um, you know, really, uh, I mean, it, it's just very shallow. It's very easy to see through, but you see these, you know, televangelists and Lear jets and with all of this wealth. And you just think, is that, is that really the Christian faith? It's not. It's not. Um, The apostle himself is saying he wants to share in his sufferings, share in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. For him, that is God's blessing. And so why do we suffer death and sort of the the feeling uh, that, that, uh, or sorry, not the feeling, but the experience that so many people have as they know that inevitably their, their lives are moving into that final phase. It often includes some illness, um, it often includes a lot of reflection on how your life has lived. And if you've known somebody in, the, in that phase and you've gone through that, them uh, with that, then you know this very well. In the Christian life, that phase is the completion of what's called our sanctification. It completes the Holy Spirit's work in us. If you become a follower of Jesus at a very early point in your life, hopefully over the course of your life, an evidence that you actually are in Christ and that the Holy Spirit is in you, and that exchange that I mentioned has happened, that your sin has been exchanged for his righteousness, an evidence of that is that you should change over those many, many years. You should be a very different person, not a perfect person, not a sinless person, but very much a changed person. Matured not just in normal ways, but matured in abnormal ways uncommon ways, spiritually matured. If you've known a person like this who has great godliness, or we might say they're very Christ-like, that maturity has happened in their lives. I I promise you, if you ask this person, they weren't like that decades ago. They'll tell you stories about how they were, and you're like, "I, I 
I can't imagine you ever being like that. And they'll say, no, this, this was me. But you're a very different person now. I admire you. I want to be like you. I want to figure out how you became like this. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And often the final stages of our lives, we see great godly people, this all sort of come together. It sort of all culminates. And so death is the completion of their sanctification. It's the completion of the Holy Spirit's preparation in their lives for eternity. It comes to completion in that. It doesn't always happen in in joyous ways. It happens often through sadness. Uh, It it happens sometimes uh, we experience some confusion over it. But nonetheless, in our lives, that's precisely what's happening. I'll just read uh, one more. Uh, Why do we die? And and then we'll, we'll move on to the next question. The reason why we die, uh, if you could turn to Romans 8, there's a um, number of passages from Romans 8 that we'll look at. If you want to put your finger there, we'll return to Romans 8, verses 12 through 17. So the first reason why we who are in Christ, why we still die, is that it completes the Holy Spirit's work. It brings to culmination and a summation of the Holy Spirit's work in our life because the Holy Spirit knows full well the course of your life, what will happen, and the precise moment that it will come to an end. So none of this is a surprise to him. It's all his plan the entire time that your life should take the course that it takes so that you would be sanctified in him and prepared in the ways that God determines you to be prepared. And then verses 12 through 17 from uh, Romans 8. Paul says this, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father." The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. So this is a very important idea. Death brings us into, ultimately, by the Spirit's sanctifying work in our lives, what's the culmination of that? Union with Christ. Maybe you know of this biblical metaphor. There's Jesus Christ, of course, the Lord, and the church who goes by this name, the Bride of Christ. The idea is our union with him is something like a marital union. The Bible says that when a man and woman come together, they become one flesh. Now, of course, they don't physically fuse. We never see that happening. Sex, of course, is the most physically intimate that any two people can be. It's obviously, you know, bodily and proximity, and you can't get any more intimate than that. Humans don't have a way to get any more intimate. And it's not just, again, bodily. It's felt emotionally. And in fact, the Bible expresses that it's spiritually. And it's, in fact, so intimate that it brings two souls together. That's the great error of promiscuity. It is breaking off pieces of your soul, whether you like it or not, sort of casting them to the wind and emptying the self of its dignity, right? And so um, marriage is the bringing together of two souls, and that's only a, uh, a sort of uh, shadow of the unity that we have with Jesus Christ. So it's not just about Jesus being my Lord out there, but it's about being wedded to him in the deepest way, such that we have real union with Christ. And so that's the Christian hope. It's not just about heaven. It's about union with Christ. And the apostles talk about suffering with him, knowing him at the deepest depths, even in pain, and desiring to be with him, even in his suffering. All right, so that's why we die. Now let's do, let's do this. This is the question of the, day, uh, of the hour, rather. <laughs> We're not going to do this for a whole day. We'll be done in just a, for a question of the hour. Uh, what happens when we die? Okay, what happens when we die? All right. What does the Bible say? So reader number three, you never came forward. You were in the back. Reader number three, do you want to? Did I have somebody back there? Were you reader number three? Reader number one. You ready? Okay. All right. (laughs) Hebrews 9. All right. Hebrews 9, 24 through 28. 
There we go, 24 through 28. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I I missed the first verse, but that's okay. We'll look at the second one. Um, We just read the Hebrews passage. Um, The key, key idea in there was verse 27. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. The unbeliever, the person who does not recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ, this is a, another offensive um, uh, thing um, to hear. The Christian idea is not that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That's not the idea. But people who do not recognize and admit the lordship of Jesus Christ face judgment. That's the idea. And, and uh, that's the sort of old hellfire and brimstone kind of message of the Christian faith. Um, We try to soften it. We try to make it more relevant. We try to make it more palatable. Uh, But there it is. It's it's not going away. That is the Christian idea. And if it's offensive, we Christians have to accept um, that, that that's in fact what it is. Those who do not accept the lordship of Jesus Christ face judgment. This idea that... um, that perhaps there are other options. Uh, The Bible doesn't make that clear, that perhaps there are other ways. The Bible makes it clear that there's no other way. Jesus says that I am the only way. There's no other way. And again, this is offensive. Uh, People think, well, why why must Christians be so narrow-minded and say that this is the only way? Well, this is the teachings of Jesus. Jesus himself insists on this. And if we recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ, we would be hypocrites to say, well, but Jesus isn't right about that. He seemed to think that he was the only way and there was no other way, uh, but we don't believe that. Well, then we ought not call ourselves Christians, right? And so maybe some people will say, okay, fine, fair enough. Everybody should stop being Christians because it's too bigoted. It's too narrow-minded. But that's the simple fact. That is what the Christian uh, um, gospel teaches, that those who are not in Christ, those who do not recognize his uh, lordship, face judgment, face judgment. So the first verse, so that's, that's for unbelievers. The one that I skipped there was 2 Corinthians. Somebody help me. I don't have my glasses. I'm going to need your help again. I'm, I'm flipping around the Bible. I do the whole God eats popcorn thing. You do that, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I have a PhD in theology. I still do God eats popcorn. Okay. <laughs> You don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Does God eat popcorn? That's what you're wondering. What did he say? 2 Corinthians 5. Thank you. What happens to believers when they die? 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we have it our aim to please him. I think that through eight, is that what I have? Oh, I went to nine. Oh, to 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay, two very different messages there. In the 2 Corinthians 5 passage, what it says is that we who, uh, who are in Christ, when you are away from the body, what happens at death? You leave a body behind. It's actually no longer a body. It's now a cadaver. It's a fundamentally different thing. It's only a body when it's ensouled or when the soul is operating. 
And so it's not an operable, it's not like a car that you can hop out of and somebody else can hop in your car and, and borrow it. Uh, it's now inoperable, right? It's only operable when its native soul is, is, is animating the body. And so we leave behind something that decays and rots and goes away. But what happens to us? We go into being the presence of the Lord. So you are fundamentally a soul. You will go into God's presence. That's what will happen to you if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, the other passage that we read, the Hebrews passage, you face judgment. Okay, And so that, that is uh, what Christian theology entails. Um, <clears throat> there are three options that are... Um, uh, that sometimes people uh, suggest that are not biblical. Um, you know what? I've got the passages there for you. In the sake of time, for the sake of time, and sorry, I, I didn't, I, didn't um, I tried to practice this on the plane, and the guy next to me was like, could you stop? Uh, so I was like, I need your help, sir. <laughs> you see the passages there, but let me just say this. When we die, we don't face annihilation. So some people have suggested annihilationism, that particularly those who are not in Christ, the idea of hell is just too hard to accept. It's just too hard to swallow. So it's actually a little bit more of a happy idea to think that those who are not in Christ don't face eternal punishment after judgment or hell or something like that. But what they face is annihilation. They simply cease to exist. Um, Unfortunately, that's not a biblical idea. So the Matthew passage indicates that Jesus himself teaches that the judgment is eternal. There is eternal judgment that one faces when they're not in Christ. And again, even for us, that's, that's a very hard idea to swallow. We can think about loved ones that we, we don't know whether they were in Christ or not, and we have doubts, and that, causes, that can cause great anxiety. I, I entirely understand that. To be sort of theoretical about this and sort of scientific and just say, well, this is what the Bible says is one thing, but then to live it and experience it and think about our loved ones, it's, it's, it can be painful. But the Bible doesn't encourage that idea that there's some sort of annihilation. In fact, that wouldn't be justice. That really wouldn't be justice. If God cares about justice and there's a distinction between good and evil, and there is a sort of recompense for justice, uh, then annihilationists wouldn't achieve that. Um, and then you see the, uh, the verse in Revelation, if you just want to j- jot that down, some people suggested that, that perhaps our souls go to sleep, okay? And so this idea of soul sleep, that when you die, you go to sleep. That's not true. Both Peter and Paul say that when we die, we go into the direct presence of the Lord. So we go to have the presence of the Lord those who die in Christ, they're called a great crowd of witnesses. And in Revelation, we see the saints who have died in Christ, particularly martyrs who were killed for the name of Jesus Christ, crying out for God's justice. They're conscious, interacting with God, fellowshipping with God, not asleep. There's this biblical idea that, um, or this biblical, uh, what, what is it called? A metaphor, I guess. Um, <clears throat> sometimes death is called falling asleep. Okay. But it's not meant to be taken in that sense that we lose consciousness or something like that. It's, it's, it's um, a sort of common metaphor. But the Bible does teach that the afterlife, the presence with God is conscious. And then finally, this idea of purgatory. It's a Catholic idea uh, that perhaps you're aware of. And it's this idea that between heaven and hell, people who still need to have their sins purged because they've done so many sins still need to spend some time in that sort of process of God purging them and pulling out the sins for them and making them prepare for heaven. Okay, that is a Catholic medieval idea. That is not an ancient Christian idea. You don't see it in the ancient church, and you certainly don't see it in the Bible. Uh, Catholic theology got it from some extra biblical sources and developed the idea later, especially after the Reformation, after the emergence of Protestantism. Uh, just, Just frankly, Catholic theology tended to double down on things that we think of as quintessentially Catholic today that are just, for us, Protestant evangelical Christians just strike us as so strange, like their views of Mary and this idea of purgatory and things like this that we don't read in the Bible and we don't speak about in our churches because, you know, we, we tend to at least try to stick to the Bible in our teaching. Um, they developed it after the Reformation, largely, in response to the Reformation. It's sort of like, oh, you, you think we're Catholic? You don't like Catholicism? Well, we're going to Catholic even harder, right? And so some of this stuff, 
some of the stuff, the development of the doctrine of purgatory, and I don't mean to just be flippant or something like that, but it, it frankly did happen a bit later. And so this idea of purgatory um, is, 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 is not biblical. Our sins aren't purged through penance on our part or through pain and suffering on our part. Our sins are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ does the work. This is the, the, the notion of the gospel. So you don't do any work to get rid of your sins. It would be like you operating on yourself and getting the cancer out of yourself. Not only do you not have the ability to do it, but you would kill yourself even trying, right? And so if the cancer is in you, well, I'm going to operate on myself and save a little bit of money. No, you're dead. We all know that you're going to kill yourself. You need a great physician to do it. You need a great physician, and the physician himself does it. And if you want to thank the physician for his great work, then you thank the physician. But you don't thank yourself. You can't purge yourself of it. And so this whole idea of purgatory actually robs God of his glory and the salvation that he gives to us and says, well, you just have to go through a little bit more suffering, and God requires a little bit more suffering. No, the Christian suffering, as you read the apostles, is joyous. It's about fellowship. It's not about... God, I'm doing this for you so that all my sins will come because I'm so magnanimous. That's not the idea at all. That's not the idea. And so the whole idea of purgatory or being in limbo or something like that uh, are not biblical ideas. So the idea, again, is this. What happens when we die? If you're in Christ, you go immediately to be in joyous fellowship with God, participating in his holiness, protected by his love, right, and in his care. If you die and you're not in Christ, you go to face judgment. And that's, that's again, the biblical idea. So uh, let's just round this out. Um, and sorry, readers, you did such a great job, but I got behind on time. This is my own bad planning. And then I want to leave quest- uh, some time for questions. So let me just uh, feel free to, to jot these things down. But what happens after we die would be the last thing. And you've got some verses here. What happens after we die? Very importantly, for we who are in Christ, um, there's a few things. Uh, one, glorification and two, union with Christ. Glorification, that's the term that the Bible uses. It also uses this term, the resurrection of the flesh. So the ultimate um, end for you and me is not to be a wispy spirit floating in heaven. That's not the ultimate end. You're a human. How are humans made? How are humans made and formed? Body and soul. God breathed into the dust of the ground. You are a material being. This is very important. Your destiny is resurrection. Jesus Christ is called the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the proof that you will be raised from the dead bodily. Your home is earth. Earth was made for us. This is where we'll live. We will live on earth and we'll be resurrected. That's a biblical idea. You will not be floating in heaven. Now you might say, well, that's bad news because we wanted to be with Jesus and Jesus is in heaven. God is the Lord of heaven, right? Heaven and earth come together in the new creation. Heaven and earth come together. And so it's the restoration of the Garden of Eden in a more, even more glorious way. And you will be resurrected. You will be resurrected. Your resurrected body will be like Jesus' resurrected body. Perfect, incorruptible. Think of Jesus' resurrected body in the upper room. In Luke 24, after he was dead and the apostles are saying, did we see him? Was that really him? And they're debating. Even Thomas is there and and he says, you didn't see Jesus. You guys are delusional. They're fighting and they're arguing. And Jesus appears in the upper room with the windows and doors closed. And the first thing he does is he says, do you have anything to eat? Not because he's hungry, but because he shows them, you're not looking at a hologram. This is not a ghost. I'm Jesus. And that's vitally important. John says in John 1.14, we touched him and we beheld him. That's vitally important to the disciples. In order for us to have a personal relationship, if you want to have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with somebody, you want to hug them. You want to kiss them, right? You want to touch them. And so they saw Jesus. They touched him. They kissed him. They loved him. They were near to him. When my daughter, she's 21 now, but I remember when she was four, she realized that one day, her dad would die. She was sitting on my lap. And uh, it occurred to her that I would die one day. And um, she started crying. And you probably experienced this. You know, children will do this when they realize their parents are going to die. It, it dawns on them. They, they understand what death is, and then they realize, oh, no, mommy and daddy. And then I'm going to be alone. That was her thought. And she said, daddy, I know you're going to die one day. And, I, and the tears just started coming down her cheeks. And I said to her, um, Baby, you know the story of Jesus, right? 
And she said, yes. And I said, okay, Jesus died. And then what happened? And she said, well, God raised him. And I said, that's right, God raised him. And his friends saw him, and they hugged him, and they touched him. And I said, put your hand on my face. And I said, what, what do you feel? And she said, your beard is scratchy. And I said, that's right. Do you like my scratchy beard? And she says, not always. Not always. <laughs> but you know it's me, right? She said, yeah. I said, whose beard is this? She said, that's my daddy's beard. I said, that's right. And I said, you can sit on my lap, and you can touch my scratchy beard if you want, because we love each other. I'm your daddy. You're my daughter. Do you, do you like that? And she said, yeah. And I said, baby, you're right. One day I will die. And she started crying even harder because I told her she was right. She didn't want to hear that. But like Jesus, God is going to raise me from the dead. And many, many, many years from now, if we're both in Christ, you can still come to me and sit on my lap and touch my scratchy beard. It'll be the same beard. And for a four-year-old, that's what she wanted to know. She didn't want to know that one day her dad will be a wispy spirit because that's one step away from just being a memory. That's not relevant to us. What's relevant to us is that people that we can see and touch and kiss and hug, right? And so that's your destiny, glorification. Your destiny is resurrection. Not only the resurrection of yourself, but the restoration of all of creation that was broken in the fall. So the amazing story of the gospel is that it... <laughs> The gospel understands the whole of biblical history. It understands that the curse is entirely reversed, right? Death is incurred in the fall, and resurrection is the promise of Jesus' ministry in the gospel. All of nature falls into disarray through sin, and all of nature is restored through the work of Jesus Christ. And then secondly, as I mentioned, um, union with Christ, these various passages, I wish I had time to read through all of them. I suspected that I might not, and, but I want to end here. We will have union with Christ, and the Bible talks in these ways, that we'll have union with Christ. So not just with Christ, like proximity and presence, like Jesus is right here, and I'm right here. I can't believe I'm so close to him. Okay, it's not like that sort of with, but the Bible talks about us being raised with him, we are raised with him. What happened on the cross? He bound himself to us. He took your sin on himself and gave you his righteousness. And so now you're bound with him. So his resurrection is your resurrection. We're raised with him. Where did he go? He ascended, Philippians 2, to the highest place. He returned back to his home, the throne room of God. That's where he belongs. That's where he came, that's where he came from. And we rose with him. So the apostles say, we walk in boldly. Remember I told you that God was holiness like the sun and we're little wax people? Well, the apostles tell us now we walk in boldly. How do we walk in boldly? Because we're with Christ and we're in Christ and we're protected from God's holiness, from burning us into smithereens because we're in Christ. And so the Bible talks about us being with Christ, in Christ, Christ in us, and then ultimately that we are made like Christ. And this is all called union with Christ. And so that's our destiny. That's ultimately our destiny. So as I said before, you know, life and death and where you go when you die is an important question, but it's not the main question of the Christian faith. The main question of the Christian faith is, who is Lord? And the Christian answer is not that Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. That's the main answer of the Christian faith. And so our destiny is to be in union with him through his death and resurrection. Um, okay, let me end it there. And thank you so much. And let me just open it for Q&A because I just I dropped a lot of things on everybody and I'm sure that you have some things to ask. Yeah, do we have micro Jeff? Got the microphone. Is this the one you're going to use? Yeah. Okay. So I've got two questions actually. One is, does the Bible indicate that the final outcome of the wicked, those who reject Christ, is any different than those who have never had an opportunity to hear the gospel? That's a wonderful question. There are some who overtly reject the gospel and some who have never heard, and they seem to be two very different groups. It seems to me, I'm, that's a valid question. It seems to me 
that biblically speaking, that yes, the destiny is the same. That those who are not in Christ are not saved. And so through explicit rejection or simply through never coming to receive the gospel. Now, this, this strikes us as, as a really difficult uh, uh, thing because there are so many people who, you might say of no fault of their own, never even hear the name of Jesus. And so that strikes us as fundamentally and absolutely unfair. Um, in the book of Job, Job and his friends are wrestling with the fairness and justice of God. So if you know that book, um, if you haven't read the book and you want to, it's a marathon. It's a marathon, and it's this sort of debate that's wearying. It goes chapter after chapter after chapter, and it's a question about God's justice. God allows Satan to absolutely terrorize Job in his life, going so far as killing his, his children and burning up all his possessions, and, and um, his, his life ends up being more or less just an ash heap. And it's Job's lament. And they're asking this question of God's justice. And at the end of the book of Job, God speaks from the whirlwind. And he goes on a brief monologue about his greatness and his goodness. And at the end of God's monologue, God, uh, Job challenges God. And he says, God, answer yourself. Answer me. Where is your justice? Why have you permitted this? This strikes me as fundamentally unfair and wrong. Why have you made me your enemy? God never gives him an answer. He talks about his greatness and goodness, and at the end, Job Job says, I raise no more objection. I lay my, my hand over my mouth. And the only person satisfied with the book of Job is Job himself. The reader's unsatisfied. All of Job's friends are unsatisfied. That's not satisfying. That's not an answer. Ironically, the book of Job doesn't give us an answer. But it does tell us that God is great and God is good. And so he is just. So I'm perplexed about this. I'm perplexed about the fate of the unevangelized. I don't know the answer. So I'll just tell you that. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. It seems to me that those who are not in Christ face judgment. But I know that God is great and God is good. And it's not unjust. It's, it can strike me as unjust. But I don't know the full picture. I don't know the full story. I don't know what would have been otherwise. I don't know that if evangelist had come to so-and-so that he would have joyously received. I don't, you know, I don't know those sort of counterfactuals that God would know. So that's my partial answer, and I wish it were a lot better. But, you know, Thank you. yeah. And you had a second one. Yeah. The second question is, are angels also created in the image of God? And if not, what's the the distinction between them and us? Great. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, It seems to me that angels are not created in the image of God. Okay, so angels, we know of a few angels in Scripture that go by the names of Michael and Gabriel or maybe some, some names that you've heard of. They present themselves as persons much like us. Now, persons from a very different place, namely heaven, and they'll say, you know, I've I'm the messenger, I'm the angel, and they'll come and they'll, they'll say that, that God has given me this message, and so they come from this otherworldly place, and they present themselves in human form. But the Bible doesn't say that they're made in God's image. In fact, angels, in that sense, like Michael and Gabriel, don't have sonship. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are all sons of, of God, and you might be like, well, I'm a, I'm a lady. I would like to be a daughter. Fair enough, but biblically speaking, we're all sons of God. Right, sons of God. And it's not a sort of chauvinistic thing. The idea there is that we are God's heirs. And in this ancient sort of legal context, that the eldest son is the heir. But it also implies a sort of personal, direct fellowship and communion um, that only humans have. Angels don't have sonship. They don't, they don't have that. So there's no indication that angels are made in God's image. In fact, the Bible says that we enjoy a sort of salvation and a sort of fellowship with God that even angels desire to look into, but it's something that they can't know. Uh, the difference between us and angels is something like we are, uh, our, our, our father is, a, is let, let's say, a, um, a farmer. and We are the sons of the farmer and they're hired hands. And we perhaps do the same work, but we have a very different relationship. 
um, to the, you know, the Lord of the farm or whatever. I just made something up. The Lord of the farm. That's terrible. Please don't. I hope that never turns into a movie. Okay. Um, but here's another fundamental difference. We are made to be embodied. So in the intermediate state between death and resurrection, that's not the final place for us. And I imagine that when in, we're in the intermediate state, we know that it's not quite right. We don't feel quite right. And the saints in the throne, under the throne in Revelation, they're crying out for God for justice and for resurrection. And so we want to be embodied. We want to be human. You're human. You want to be human. Be a human. We don't want to be wispy souls. Angels, apparently biblically, can temporarily take on bodies, but I don't think that's their natural state. Maybe they feel overdressed or heavy or something, and they desire to be disembodied. So they are, they are spiritual beings, souls that are ordered such as to be essentially disembodied, and we're souls that are ordered essentially to be embodied. And so that's a sort of metaphysical difference between us and angels, but the more important spiritual difference is that we are sons and have that sort of fellowship with God that angels never have, apparently. Oh, a couple. There's a couple. What happened to the, what's going to happen to the people of the Old Testament? And I'm not talking about Abraham and Moses and all those, just the regular folks of the Old Testament. Oh, great question. So you're talking about, um, let's say, the people of God, Israel, and those sorts of people. You mentioned some of the key people of the Old Testament, Abraham and Moses. We have every reason to think Jesus talks about them, and we see them transfigured, right? We see Moses there transfigured um, at the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, We have every reason to think that these Old Testament saints are in Christ. They weren't saved by their obedience to the law, but they were actually saved by Jesus, and they testify that Jesus is Lord even to um, the New Testament church. When Peter sees Moses there, the Mount of Transfiguration, recognizing the Lordship of Jesus Christ, right? That's, that's um, that sort of testimony of the church. You're asking about, what about all the other people? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Biblically, I don't know. There's this very vague passage about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison after his death and before his resurrection that Peter tells us about. I don't, I'm not a New Testament scholar. Um, I'm a philosopher of religion, so Billy said, can you teach us what the Bible says? And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I read the Bible like the rest of us, but I'm not a, I'm not a New Testament guy. So I don't know the details of that passage. Um, but it seems to me that, um, that through history, there are people who are saved by Jesus before and after the resurrection. Um, and even in ways, sometimes to the question of the unevangelized, even in ways that sometimes we don't think are normal, they're saved by Jesus. Um, I, I very much believe in, uh, th- actually through personal experience, that there are people around the world who come to know Jesus as Lord, apart from evangelists. This has happened a lot in the Islamic world through dreams, because in Islam, dreams and the interpretation of dreams are considered very important. And um, I've, I've known, um, I, I do know, in fact, one um, Muslim who came to Christ through a dream and didn't know anything about Jesus. And then later on met some Christians, and he said, that's what I believe. Where, do you, where can I learn that? He didn't know anything, right? So anyway, I, I don't want to get into those tangents, but um, yeah, it seems to me that, that old te- so-called Old Testament saints are also saved by Jesus. So, yeah. so in uh, Matthew 24, uh, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world and as a testament to all nations, and then the end will come. So everyone will be preached to at one point. Yeah, all nations, so all the various people groups. The idea of the gospel is that it should go to um, the ends of the earth. You know, uh, Jesus gives this commission to his disciples to take this gospel to the end of the earth. So it, it dawns on the people Uh, on the disciples, rather, it dawns on the disciples that Jesus Christ is not just the Savior of Israel. He's not just the King of the Jews, but he's actually the King of the whole world. He's the Lord of the whole world. And so this was always God's plan. This was always God's plan to save all of humanity, to create one new humanity out of the broken, tribalized humanity that existed before. 
But, you know, to, to the previous question, you know, there are people groups um, that for, you know, many, many years never had any evangelism, never had any exposure to the gospel. Eventually, what you were uh, referring to us uh, in, in Matthew 24, every people group, every tongue, every language, every sort of type of, of person, cult, culturally speaking, will be represented in heaven. But, you know, anyway, thank you for that. A great deal of what you've described and that w what we believe is based on the concept of us being made in the image of God. I think of an image as a visual representation. And, and I really hope that God is better looking than I am. <laughs> <laughs> my wife thinks I'm cute sometimes but that's as far as it should go could you unpack some what being made in the image of God is other than a visual representation yeah yeah absolutely let me first say you're beautiful <laughs> and you know, I don't I don't mean that as a joke um it was a good it was a good joke nonetheless Humans are beautiful. Um, you know, we, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we do think of beauty in very sort of culturally formed ways and sort of external ways. We, we, we do that. We know that we do that. But, you know, there's this old aphorism and, and we, we, we sort of act like we believe it and then kind of act like we don't believe it. But, you know, beauty isn't just skin deep. But it actually is true. Um, when somebody is truly beautiful, it's, you're recognizing in them something that goes much deeper. You might, you know, I mean, all you men, I can relate with the men who've had this experience. You see, you know, a woman who's really beautiful and you're just sort of in awe and you go starry-eyed. And then you meet her personality and she's not that great. <laughs> it's just... I, I used to think she was, I, you know, when I see her coming, I want to go that direction. She's not attractive. She's repulsive, right? And so that's the more important part. And so, yeah, the image of God, as you said, um, image sounds very, you know, physical. So what is the image of God? Uh, it certainly goes deeper. We don't have divine properties. God is all-knowing, omniscient. But we have high order rationality. The stuff that we're doing right now, dogs can't do, as I mentioned, to think these deep thoughts. We think deep thoughts after God. We will never know everything that God knows, but um, we can think thoughts something like, uh, and deep spiritual thoughts, and those deep spiritual truths that animals can never know. Um, that is in part what it is to be made in the image of God, to have deep emotive qualities, to deep, have deep joy and deep pain and sorrow. Whatever it is for God to have joy and sorrow is perhaps qualitatively different than us. But biblically, we know that God is not dispassionate, that the Spirit grieves over our sins. Whatever that means for God, God rejoices over his beloved, right? Uh, whatever that means... I imagine that it's quite different, but something like my jo joyousness and even my grief is modeled something on, on the way uh, that God is. Um, and then, as I said, having deep capacity for fellowship and friendship and, um, and communion um, is something that is intrinsic to God's nature. To give yourself to someone else, to offer yourself and open yourself up to someone else is a dangerous thing. And for them to open themselves up to you, and we call that friendship, and hopefully we would have that in marriage as well, and, and things like that. That sort of deep communion is a divine property. So, um, you know, the Bible doesn't spell out everything, but we can sort of examine our own souls and our own social lives and things. And in the in the best ways, the best expressions of those things would be what make us different than sheer, sheer animals being made in God's image. So, those sorts of things. So after we die, if we're all going to be resurrected on earth, how are we all going to fit? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. The new heaven and new earth 
Um, in Revelation, if you read the descriptions of it, have a very different quality. It's actually said that the new earth has no sea. I'm not sure why it says that. I, again, I'm not a New Testament person. I don't know the meaning of that. But the new earth is a fundamentally different kind of place. And so whatever the meaning of the earth having no sea means, I don't... Yeah, I, I can't even speculate as to the meaning of that. But it is a fundamentally different kind of place. And it... Um, so how will we all fit? Will the world be overpopulated or something like that? Of course, the Bible doesn't answer doesn't answer that. And I don't think it's a conundrum. But um, you know, when when um, you know Jesus tells us that we can't even imagine. I mean, our, our our highest speculations won't even get close to what the new heaven and the new earth will be like. So I guess I just have to say that's that's a good question. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see how that. I guess how that works out. But yeah. Okay, we get, we're going to do one more. Make it a good one. <laughs> this is the last one. You're so cute. <laughs> You're not going to leave that one down. Right? I think he's really cute too. But what does it mean that we're going to have glorified bodies? Our yeah. new glorified bodies. Yeah, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 uh, through 46. You might look at that. Um, glorified bodies. Uh, it's the sort of body that Jesus had. Um, not susceptible to corruption. The resurrected body does not die again. Right? Um, Jesus appeared, as I said, in the upper room in Luke 24, with the windows and the doors closed. He appeared in the room. You would think, this is a ghost. Because he didn't, you know, sort of phase through the walls or something like that. He merely appeared in the room. What kind of physical body can do that? This challenges notions of physics, I suppose, because physics doesn't work that way. And so the glorified body has totally different qualities. Um, you know, often we want to ask, what will we, we look like, right? Uh, my, gl- my glorified body. You're going to look like you. You, you, your, your, your soul, you order matter, you know, the physical stuff to look like you. So, you know, sometimes people wonder, are we going to recognize each other? Of course, you're going to look like you. But we're going to recognize each other in a much deeper sense, not just in a physical sense, but we're going to see each other soul to soul in a very deep way. So that's part of the glorification. Um, I don't know, maybe everybody's, maybe we're all at the, at the physical peak, right? And so your, your, your soul will be perfectly energized. And so the, the body that, that, that goes with it will be perfectly energized. And so if you look at old pictures of yourself, go back and look at high school pictures, and you're like, dang, wow, that was, <laughs> okay. Well, you got that for eternity. That's awesome. But it's not just, it's not just about vanity. It's not just about vanity. It'll be something even, even more beautiful than that. I mean, we will truly be beautiful, but in the deepest, most important sense, not in sort of the vain surfacey sense. Um, and so, yeah, glorification um, involves a fundamental transformation of what it means to be human. I hope that helps a little bit. Without sin, yeah. Sanjay, last question. Billy didn't really want to ask this himself, but he wanted to know whether or not there's in and out burgers in heaven. <laughs> We're all West Coast people, so I can't imagine heaven otherwise. I just... <laughs> Yes, absolutely.